Welcome to our Let's Talk Music series. We're also streaming this event live all over the world, so hey guys out there, wherever you're looking from, I hope you enjoy. So um, Let's Talk Music is uh, an interview series, it's very intimate, and we have artists, we have uh, record producers, we'll have general people in the music business come, and you can see they'll be here, and, they'll, and we, have, uh, we have Wayne, Native Wayne is the host of all of these series. He's a double Grammy winning producer with No Doubt. He's been a DJ on K-Rock and Sirius Radio. So he always is the, the interviewer. And of course tonight we've got Incubus. Yeah. With Brendan Boyd and Mike Einzinger. So Incubus, you know, they're, they're, a local, they're a local group. They went to Calabasas High School, which is in Southern California. In 1991 they formed the band and of course we all know how successful they were. So. Let's invite in Native Wayne, Brandon Boyd, and Mike Einzinger. It's not a big stage. Here, come sit here, Brandon. Welcome to Let's Talk Music. I'm Native Wayne Jobson, and we're honored and blessed this evening to have one of America's great rock bands. They've sold 13 million albums, two Grammy nominations, have been nominated for American Music Awards, Billboard Awards, and you know, just lots of uh, awards like that. So let's hear it for Mikey Einziger and Brandon Boyd. So, Mikey, first of all, um, thanks for coming. I know you were ill, and are, are you feeling better? Yeah, much better. Sorry that we had to cancel last week. I was sick. You can blame it all on me. It's my <laughs> fault. Better well, now. Much better now. Great to see you back with us, man. So, of course, Mikey is, was um, voted number 41 of the top 100 greatest guitarists of all time. Let's hear it for Mikey. Who's so, um, number 40? What's that? Who is number 40? <laughs> Gotta go um, get that guy. Who's so number 42? <laughs> 42, man. So, so growing up, um, what were your influences as far as guitar, like Hendrix and those kind of people? Um, I listened to a lot of, uh, you know, Brandon and I listened to a lot of the same music. We, we, we met each other when we were nine years old, 10 years old, and uh, we kind of grew up listening to a lot of the same music together, um, which was, uh, you know, early on, I was really into, uh, like, Michael Jackson and... Uh, Van Halen, like the early 80s, you know, that was a, a really special time in music. Um, and then uh, must have been about, you know, seven years old during that time period, eight years old. And then um, going on into like middle school and high school, I started getting into stuff like uh, Led Zeppelin, Jimi Hendrix, The Doors. Um, and then later on in, in high school, it was more uh, like, you know, Nirvana had just kind of uh, become really popular, and uh, Soundgarden, and uh, Faith No More, and uh, Alice in Change. There was that whole sort of period of time, the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Um, and, uh, you know, I could just keep going and going and going. There's so much music, you know. And, uh, and more recently, I guess, I started getting into uh, uh, classical music that I had never really been exposed to um, in the last, you know, like eight or ten years. So, yeah, it just keeps going. That's what's so great about music is you can continually uh, discover new music all the time. You'll never get to a point, at least I will never get to a point where I'm not curious about it anymore. Fantastic. Yeah. So, Brandon, it was 1991 that Incubus was formed and you were all like school friends. Do you think it's this brotherhood that has, has made you last for like 24 years and been so successful? I definitely think that's part of it. Um, we were just saying back there that We've known each other for about 30 years, which is crazy. Crazy. You still look really young, too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for saying that. I appreciate yeah, that. Man. Of course. Friends need to compliment each other. Yes, they do. You look so remarkably young, Brandon. I yeah, can't this is, stand this it. This is how our band is still together. It's like, are you OK? 
You look good. <laughs> kind of serious, though. <laughs> That's some of it, yes. Uh, I think that our, um, our friendship and, you know, we're, we're, I think at this point we're more like brothers than friends. And, um, for, and that's good and bad sometimes, but I think that for our, the, the wider scope of our relationship and especially our creative relationship, we just, we communicate very well together. So, and it's fun still, that part's important too. So back in the early days, did you ever get any, any voice lessons or music lessons? Me? I took two voice lessons from Woodlow Music in Woodland Hills and um, that was all I could afford. Uh, they were expensive. But I learned to, uh, can we swear on this show? Yeah. Okay, the, the voice teacher, um, Chuck, told me to sing like I was taking a shit. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> many, <laughs> that's exactly what he told me. Many pairs of underwear later, here I am. Uh, I actually just started taking voice lessons last year for, but first like serious voice lessons that I've ever taken. And it's incredible, like diving into music, how much there is, it's just a, it's a, a, a never ending sort of rabbit hole that you can jump down. Um, and so I've been learning a lot about my voice, what it feels like for the first time. It's fun. Fantastic. And Mikey, you got lessons as well? I took lessons like Brandon for a very short period of time, actually at the same little uh, music store. Yeah, it was called Woodlow Music. It was a guy uh, named Peter Layton. He was uh, my guitar teacher for a few months. Um, and once I got to a point where I could hear the music that I wanted to play and then I could learn how to play it, um, I could teach it to myself. Once I was pr proficient enough in that respect, um, I just became wildly obsessed with playing songs you know, that I thought were interesting and stuff that was always slightly out of my ability level. I think that's what really kept me going was um, figuring out how to play things that I didn't think I could play and then I would surprise myself continually. And um, yeah, so lessons helped me in the very beginning just sort of get the skills that I needed to keep going. Fantastic, man. And talking about getting lessons, um, I was in Jamaica a few years ago, and you two were down there, and they had just finished a big tour, and Bono and Edge were going back to like the south of France to hang out. And Adam Clayton, the bass player, I said to him, are you going to go on holiday? And he goes, no, I'm going to New York to get bass lessons every day for a year. And I'm like, you're in the biggest band in the world. You've already sold, you know. What? And he says, I'm not good. I can get much better. And another example is I was at Soundcheck once with John Mayer, who I just saw at, at um, Coachella. And, and John Mayer was doing the soundcheck, and he said to his guys, hurry up, hurry up with the soundcheck. I've got to get back to my room to do my online guitar lesson. And here's one of the best guitarists in the world talking about online, <laughs> so you can always get better, which is leading up to Mikey, as you know, being rated like 41 top 100 guitarists of all time. And then in 2008, you decided to take a break from the band and go back and get music lessons at Harvard. Explain that to us. <laughs> a lot of explain. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to explain it. Um, I mean, I, it wasn't so much that I wanted to get music lessons. I had just never studied music um, in any sort of academic sense. So the music studying that I did at Harvard um, was without a guitar in my hand. Um, I, I almost didn't really pick a guitar up during that entire time. Um, it was forcing me to look at music in a really different way than I ever had before. Um, and I also wanted to, also in general, I really wanted to just study other things. I, was stu I took a lot of scientific courses, um, like life science courses and earth science courses. I was really fascinated by all of these things that, um, you know, when you bypass the entire experience of going to college to go on tour, it sounds like a dream, and it, and it is, and it was. It was amazing. But after, you know, we got to a point where actually it kind of felt like we sort of accomplished our goals. You know, all the dreams that we had as a young band, you know, selling millions of records and, and selling out, you know, huge venues, and, and we kind of did that a bunch of times in a row. It, it was kind of like this point where it was like, all right, we'll just do it again, you know? we. We got to a point where it, I, I felt I was really curious to discover sort of uh, some other, just some other things in life that I was interested in. So, um, spending a couple of years at Harvard was amazing. One of the best experiences I've ever had, and uh, unexpectedly, 
um, one of the things that I was most blown away by was studying music history. That was something I had never done before. And um, just learning about how music has evolved and changed, you know, starting, you know, I mean, music is, you know, before history, before written records has always been made, but we kind of focused on periods of time, like in the, you know, the 12th century, you know, chant music and stuff like that, moving up through the 1600s and, the, you know, the, the invention of musical instruments and the orchestra and things like that. I, it's incredible to, to kind of track the chronology and of the evolution of music over that time period. Um, just, it, it really blew my mind, it really blew my mind. It really widened um, my view, my scope of what music actually is. Um, it's such a huge place. And that's why I really mean it when I say that it's a life, you can devote lifetimes to it and never be satiated. It's just um, something that gives to you continually. You can study it forever and you'll never, I'll never get bored of it. Isn't it interesting that like all of that and all of that amazing music history leading up to it, it you know, it's all moving in a direction. It's evolving towards something and it'll never stop anywhere. But like, I, I couldn't help but think of like modern pop music and like those are its parents. Yes. <laughs> it's so Absolutely. weird. Well, it's like, <laughs> it, it's, it's kind of like, um, you go from like these symphonic, these genius three hour symphonic things to like, well, that was the movies, you know, when, when those early symphonies were written, um, in the, the early operas and stuff like that, th those were the movies that, you yeah, know, there was no radio, no TV, no movies. No, that was yeah. what people did for entertainment. Yeah. Um, exclusively. There wasn't anything else really. S nothing that what, re nothing that resembles what we have now. Mm. So, uh, to see that and kind of contextualize that was really mind blowing for mm. me. Cause I wasn't really aware of that before. <laughs> <laughs> so apart from being a wicked singer and songwriter, Brandon is also a wicked artist and you know author. So Brandon, tell us a little bit about when when the band took the break in 2008. You went and went to college and did art. <laughs> yeah, we we Mikey and I sat down. And we're like, we accomplished so many of our goals so many times over. What should we do? And we both were like, let's go to school. <laughs> um, I didn't last as long as he did in school though. <laughs> I started getting my homework assignments, and I was like, mm. <laughs> Yeah, I remember. You being were like, I gotta do work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it all of a sudden made being in a rock band seem like way more fun. Um, no, it was great. I, I uh, went to school in Los Angeles and kind of just um, dove back in, you know, head first into painting and life drawing and the things that I was doing anyway, but with very little skill attached. So I just, you know, learned some of the, the basics again. Um, but one of my, one of my enjoyments, one of my pastimes has always been drawing. And so, um, I like to publish books of the drawings. Nice. They're there. Wicked. So, um, that's um, that. <laughs> Perfect. Man. So Mikey, in the beginning it was like, um, I think it was like five years from forming the band till you got your first record deal. And that time you guys were playing like the Roxy and the Troubadour. Was it really hard at that time? And was it difficult to get your first record deal? It probably was really difficult, and all of those things were really challenging, but we we loved what we were doing so much that it f it was fun. It, f it just felt like work, you know? I mean, it, it di sorry, it didn't feel like work. It, it was just a way to make music. It was a, w for, for us in, I at that time, I was about to say in those days, but that makes you sound old. <laughs> Back in those days, um, they used to do this pay to play thing. <laughs> When I don't I know if they still age. do that. <laughs> yeah. They they used to do this thing at all the clubs where you had to pay money. I don't know if they still do it. Maybe they do. Um, where you would go and buy a couple hundred tickets from the Roxy or the Whiskey. Um, and you'd pay, you know, $2 for each one of those tickets. And then we could go out and sell them for $5. And um, we'd run out of them. You know, we'd, we'd buy 200 tickets and then we'd have to go get more. And we'd sell five or six, sometimes even 700 tickets to these little shows at the Whiskey and the Troubadour. Um, we were kind of terrible too, which is so like... Kind of terrible. <laughs> <laughs> we were terrible with a lot of heart. Yeah, we, we had fun. We were, we were yeah. really enjoying what we were doing. Um, but we also didn't realize we were starting a, what really became a, a business. You know, we, we learned so many valuable things about being musicians and also existing in the music world. Um, you know, inevitably, inevitably, if you're in a musician of any kind, um, or 
you know, a recording engineer or a producer, any of one of those things, you're going to have to deal with the music business at some point. So that was those were all really valuable years for us to learn about those things, but we did it in such a natural way that uh, it didn't feel like work at all. Yeah, every I remember every element of it was fun. Even like uh, our drummer Jose and I would draw the flyers for the shows, and we would we took a lot of pride in the flyers because we loved both loved to draw, but then we also loved um, doing different. Uh, fonts and things we would copy fonts out of our favorite old like 60s concert posters and things like that and uh, we would collect people's home addresses at shows and collect a mailing list and then so we would like meet at mike's house mikey like spent the 30 dollars and we bought one of those blade things that cuts paper and so we were we were like a little factory and then we would we would lick the stamps we'd write the you know the addresses we'd send out like hundreds of snail mail to people. Uh, it seems so archaic. It is. I mean, it's amazing. Now we just email everybody. <laughs> Please come to our show. But it worked. It was crazy. You know, we'd do all this stuff, and then we'd have a show at the Troubadour on a Friday night or a Saturday night, and there'd be 500, 600 people. There'd be a huge line, and people couldn't even get in. And it was, uh, it was, very, it was very funny, because there would be bands that were supposedly po popular bands at the time, and they would play after us. And I think that they would be thinking, like, yeah, this is going to be a huge show. This is going to be awesome. And then the entire place would clear out after we were done. <laughs> so bands started to not want to play after us. It was pretty funny. But those were mostly, like, these really bad glam rock bands, because at the time, that's, was, that's what people were doing, you know? In the early 90s, it was, like, the whole sort of Deep grunge. Deep Hollywood, yeah. The whole grunge thing started kind of coming into play, but it hadn't really hit, like, Hollywood yet. So Hollywood was still like filled with like sort of like poison wannabes and that sort of thing, like tons of bands like that. It was really, but some of those guys were so nice. Yeah, some really good musicians too. Yeah, amazing those shredder guitar players and stuff. We just played just swathed in eyeliner. And we d we just played a bunch of shows with uh, Steel Panther in s in Australia. You guys know them? Yeah, yeah, they're awesome. Super great guys. They're, I'm just, I'm just glad that uh, every time those guys would come up and talk to us, and like the first day that we were on the road, those guys would all, they all came up to us and they were like, "Man, we're huge fans." And all of us were like, like this. It was like a huge <laughs> relief. Really? Like it made, oh. makes you feel all warm and fuzzy inside. Like the bullies, the bully likes you. Like yeah. the tough kid. It's like, like the tough kid in the jail yard came up and was like, "Hey, man, you're cool." Yeah, exactly. Like, oh my god. No, those guys are incredible musicians, though. They really are. They would roll up like the makeup and all the stuff on, but then like the top, the upper half would be done, and the bottom half would be like a pair of shorts and some like Sneakers. some like sandals or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was cool. That was funny. Yeah, man. And then you you got your record deal with the Immortal Epic, and the the, the first two albums kind of went unnoticed, and then I think like your Science album sold like a hundred thousand with no airplay. How did you manage yeah. to pull that off without airplay? Just tons of touring. We we um, we had some really great allies within uh, the record label um, that allowed us and had the patience to let us just stay on the road. They would, you know, they would they put us in a van and um, and then we had a trailer and we would just drive around playing with whoever would play with us. And um, over that period of time, it was a few years. We started no. We started really being able to see that we had a following. We had a real following. We would show up in, you know, in Atlanta, at Salt Lake City, you know, in Memphis, and um, you know, Shreveport, all these different cities. And you know, there'd be 200 people. The next time there'd be 400 people, and the time after that there'd be 800 people. And it grew every time. There were very few times when it didn't feel like it was growing. And um, so there was a stead, it didn't happen really fast, but then there were a few milestones, you know, getting played on radio stations and MTV and all those things. All of a sudden, you know, that really changed things quickly. But the, up to that point was kind of a slow um, ascent. But yeah, we toured behind th our science album until we had sold a hundred and something thousand albums. And then that was when we said, okay, it's time to go make another album. Yeah, man. And then after that, you went on, you know, selling 13 million records. And then it was in 2003 that you all had the, the big lawsuit with against Epic and all that. What did that come about? And was it because your guys didn't get paid? Yeah. Partly. Yeah. We were still living in apartments, and we'd sold like 10 million albums, and 
struggling to pay rent and stuff. We were like, what's happening here? We were actually able to break it down at that time um, after having sold you know, 10 million albums or whatever it was at the time. We, um, we figured out that each of us had gotten paid about the same amount as the, the drivers who'd been driving us around. And with no disrespect to the drivers, but I think people would be really uh, shocked to see how underpaid um, you know, m many of the artists are. So we had to sue Sony uh, in order to actually get paid what they were supposed to pay us. <laughs> and it's unfortunate that we had to do that um, because you would hope that they would just do the right thing, but they, uh, eventually they did. Actually, I should at least give them credit for that. They, yeah. In the end, they did. It just took a little bit of, uh, uh, what's it called, a titty twister? Sorry. Is that what it's called? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I th yeah. Unfortunately, yes. Yeah. I think it's possible that it's even worse now for aspiring musicians. I think that there's less of an opportunity now for aspiring musicians to make a living. Um, At least for selling albums. You know? Yeah, when, when we were you know, out on the road and stuff and, and, and played on the radio and television and stuff like that, we were actually like moving units. And so there was a, a way to you know, quantify the work that we've been doing. Um, but I feel like it's probably like doubly hard now for young musicians to make a living doing what they're doing. Um, there are things that, you know, you would have mentioned them to us 10, 15 years ago, like, you know, a, a car brand wants to use your song in a commercial and it would have been completely out of the question, you know, but then, then for most fans with any sense of integrity and in and, and this day and age, it's sort of like, and w I, we'll, get, we'll get paid for that. I'm saying like this is the new sort of reality. Not all bands will do it, but a, a lot of young bands can't afford to pass opportunities like that up, which I think is kind of a shame, but the model just continues to shift and move around, you know, so. Yeah, because I know that the um, Cadillac offered the doors, the most ever in history, Cadillac offered the doors 15 million for break on through to the other side, which is a song that is already done. All they had to say was yes, mm. 15 million, and they said no because Jim Morrison wouldn't have approved it. Yeah. So they, they said no, you know, so that's the kind of credibility. Who took it though? Was it, was it uh, um, Zeppelin? Zeppelin, yeah. yeah. Page and Page yeah, and Plant yeah, yeah. got it. <laughs> they were like, we'll take it. So the doors aren't <laughs> taking that 50 million? Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we'll take it, yeah man, crazy. <laughs> I will. <laughs> mm. Yeah man, so, um, so changing the subject, tell us about the songwriting process. Do you write the songs before or in the studio? How does that work? We, you know, it's been a little bit different every time. I think that there are certain things about our songwriting process that are similar each time, but we sort of change environments all the time. And with the change in the environment, I think that some of the dynamics will shift around a little bit. Would you, would you agree with that? Yeah, definitely. We um, pretty much, uh, for the most part, um, I mean, many of the songs that we've written have had sort of a common um, process. You know, like most of the time, um, I'll write some kind of little, you know, chord progression, and it'll be in some kind of just a, like, a really minimal state, and then I'll share it with Brandon, and if, if he's inspired by it, he'll just, you know, start writing lyrics and, and melodies to it, and once we kind of have those two things, if we're both, like, really excited about it, then whatever comes next is much sort of uh, easier, you know? Uh, if, if you have a really good idea at the very beginning, then it just, it's, I've said this a million times, but it's like unwrapping a present, you know, that's what it feels like. Um, and uh, now we're in a studio where we're all set up and we're kind of writing and recording at the same time, which is different than what we've done in the past. Um, but it's been great because it allows for spontaneity and recording is so easy, it's almost like, that's almost like the, like the, that's the easy part of the process. You know, writing the material and having great material, that's the challenging part. Yeah. One thing I've noticed um, with getting a song, <coughs> excuse me, getting a song off the ground is, uh, like with you and I, like you'll write a guitar riff, and if you're enthusiastic about it, like check this out, and then, and then, and then, and then, whatever, like, and it usually gets me excited about it. I'm like, oh yeah, and we get all fun and nana together, and then we take that enthusiasm. The song's called fun and nana. Fun and nana, yeah. One more na, and uh, we'll take that enthusiasm and show it to the guys and be like, right, right, and then that enthusiasm kind of becomes infectious, and that's really been a big 
I've noticed even more recently, that's a big element in with what we do. If you show enthusiasm, like if I show you an idea and you're like, that's fucking rad, man. Do that again. I'm like, really? Okay. And it's, it's sort of a lot of sort of gentle ego stroking with songwriting, I think, too. Slash yeah. enthusiasm. Yeah. It's fun, though. The process is really fun. And that feeling of discovery when you write something that sounds and feels really good, it, it never gets old, ever, to me. Like, that's continually... It's magic. Yeah, it's magic. It's, it's something that will keep me wanting to make music for the rest of my life. Forever. Wicked, man. So apart from all of the great music, probably the most powerful thing that, that Incubus has ever done, they have a charity, a foundation called the Make Yourself Foundation. They have contributed millions to Surf Rider, Heal the Bay. In one year alone, they gave one million from sales of their CDs, tours, merchandise. They have select seats that you can auction at the shows and stuff like that. Tell us a bit about the, the Make Yourself Foundation. Uh, I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> do it. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, you said most of it. We just, we, we um, have taken this opportunity to help just raise funds and raise awareness for uh, a handful of charities. Actually, a little bit more than a handful at this point. We've been doing it for a little over 10 years. So there's quite a few um, nonprofits that we have um, helped raise money for. And there, it, it's, like, it's actually a really good time. It's a really cool way for us to, you know, meet the people who are listening to our band and are enthusiastic about our band. Um, and we've been finding out that it's a, a common practice for the VIP package that for the money to go kind of in the pocket of the bands. And um, we've never actually done that. That's been the money. It's a nonprofit, so it's like it, it comes to us and then we funnel it out into other things. And it's been fun finding out what our listeners are interested in. And um, it's like a, it's a grant process. People apply for a grant and then we decide amongst the band and goes on. Did I explain that well? Yeah, really we, not. you know, we, we, we got to a point where we felt like we could be the most effective, um, in a philanthropic sense, by starting our own foundation because we started getting approached a lot um, to play at various charity concerts, donate time, um, or donate money, and it's been our experience that the institutions that are coming to us, what they need most is money. Um, and they need awareness. So the best way for us to be effective in that is to do the sort of do the work in raising the money ourselves, um, because it, we wish we could play all these events, but we're so busy trying to do the other things that we're trying to do, make records and and tour, uh, that it's easiest for us, and I think best for us and for all of the people. That and in you know institutions that need money and help you know raising awareness um, for us to just raise the money ourselves and then we donate g very generous amounts of money to to these institutions and try and help them raise awareness by you know featuring them on websites and just talking about them in, in interviews and in the press and things like that. Um, so it's sort of also a utilitarian thing as well, not just, um, you know, it feels good and it's it makes us feel good and we're happy that we can help, um, but this is the way we think we're most effective in doing it. That's what and I know you also sell your own bootlegs to raise money for them, right? Yeah, we've done that in the past because people do it anyway. People are recording and, um, you know, we might as well record the concerts ourselves and, and uh, you know, mix them and try to make them sound a little better. At least they're, they're recordings that we endorse, you know. I don't really listen to them, so <laughs> I can't. It's like I'm too self-critical. and They do sound better than some of the cell phone recordings. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I make so many mistakes when we're playing concerts, so I just don't even want to listen to it. But if people that are listening to them enjoy it, that's, the, that's really all I care about. But you look great when you're doing it, Mike. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and, and Brandon, do you think that music can actually help change the world and change governments and stuff like that? I absolutely believe that is true. Um, it's the knee-jerk reaction is, is to think that that's sort of a foolish sentiment that like rock and roll or art could save the world. But I've witnessed firsthand as a fan and a listener, first and foremost, that um, that power that music and that art can have in an individual's life. Um, 
it changed my life at a very young age, and it sent me on a trajectory that um, I'm very grateful for. So, you know, and even if what we're doing makes someone want to be in a band themselves, to me, that's actually kind of amazing. That's like, that's one of the coolest things, one of the coolest compliments, you know, we could ever pay is like, your band made me want to be in a band. And that's why we started a band, because we loved the bands we were listening to so much. Um, but then some of the things that your favorite artists or musicians uh, say and some of the things that they do can be really impactful as well. So the Make Yourself Foundation for us has been um, sort of uh, us utilizing that opportunity, like we found the opportunity uh, to raise uh, attentions around certain things. And it's Earth Day today. Happy Earth Day, everybody. Yes. Yeah. Um, <coughs> So we've done lots of work with, with you know, um, humanitarian charities, but quite a, quite a lot of environmental charities as well. Yeah, Fantastic. it's been fun. Cool, man. So Mikey, to go to some of your um, solar projects, tell us about, um, Mikey played guitar on the song that you would all know, which is Wake Me Up with Avicii and Aloe Black. It was number one in 39 countries. Yeah, that was a, a really fun project to be involved with. Uh, the three of us, um, Avicii's name is Tim. <laughs> Um, and no. uh, <laughs> Aloe and I, we, we wrote that song at my house together and that was the first time I'd ever written music with either one of those guys so it was good job dude thanks man <laughs> yeah, everybody <it> <laughs> liked it <laughs> <laughs> thanks guys the next question is why didn't you call me? I'm just joking <laughs> I don't know I didn't think you'd be into that sort of thing I didn't know if I was into that sort of thing, but it worked out f just fine. Um, no, I'd never, you know, I'd never uh, worked on any sort of project like that before. And um, when Avicii asked if I would do something with him, I wasn't really familiar with his music, to be perfectly honest. And I, I did a little bit of research on him, and I actually really liked that level song that he had. He has a, a has an Etta James sample in it, and I thought that was a really well produced song. So I just figured, you know. He's obviously a talented guy, and we met up uh, one time before we got together right, and uh, he was just a really sweet kid, really young, really um, just excited about making music, and, um, you know, I was just kind of like, why'd you call me, <laughs> you know? He kind of could, you know, work with whoever he wants, and he just, he was a big fan of Incubus and uh, wanted to try and write some real songs, and um, so he came over, and we started writing a a piece of music, and then it got to be about seven o'clock in the evening, and he was like, I gotta go. I've actually got a session tonight with this guy, Aloe. We're gonna, you know, they were working on other songs together. And, um, well, I just said, well, why don't you just have him come over here, and let's finish this song, because we already had pretty much all the music laid out for the song Wake Me Up, and we'd written the top line melody. Um, we just didn't write any lyrics. And uh, Aloe got on the phone, I said, hey man, I'm in Malibu, come on over here and finish the song. He was like, I would love to, which I was kind of shocked by because I'd never met him before. And he said that he was a fan of Incubus and he was excited about it. So, you know, what more could you ask for really? Like a few people who are really excited about working together. So he came over and he, it was, Wake Me Up was like, it was like a poem. It was in a totally different order than that. It was like, um, something that he, he just brought in these lyrics and we kind of pieced them together to fit into the song and we knew immediately as soon as he started singing on the track it was something interesting and special. It sounded really different and kind of cool but I had no idea it was gonna turn into what it turned into, none whatsoever. Um, it was a big learning experience for me, definitely. And um, quite fun, yeah. And then after that, you, you, you co-wrote with David Guetta, so are you the new king of EDM? <laughs> <laughs> I actually know so little about electronic dance music. Um, it's more, to me, music is more about people than anything else. Like, if you meet somebody that you connect with or you really like on sort of a personal level, that's really where it has to start for me. So, you know, when I first met um, Geta, he was just a really cool guy. Seemed like somebody who'd be really fun to be in the studio with. So that's kind of just where that came from. And again, it was like one of these really sort of organic, natural things where I had no plan for anything to happen, had no idea if anything cool would happen at all, but it just sort of did, 
you know and i'm i'm thankful i love those kinds of experiences you know that's to me that's what making music is and it's great because to me it just informs everything and it makes me appreciate you know what we've been able to accomplish more than anything in the world because it it shows me how challenging it is you know and i've worked with some other people where it's been like wow you know like <laughs> this is going to be really hard <laughs> you know like we have it really easy because we work so well together and um yeah, I've I've been really lucky. I'm I'm really thankful, and and I feel really lucky to have gotten to, um, you know, be involved with the the different you know musicians that have come into into my life. Fantastic, man. So, Brandon, tell us about Absolution Calling, the new EP that's coming out, uh, May fifteenth, Inkabus. Uh, May twelfth or fifteenth? I think it's the twelfth. May twelfth, twenty fifteen. Uh, yeah, the new EP is called Trust Fall Side A, and the side A. Uh, is alluding to the fact that there will be a side B, which is coming later in the year. Um, and that's a cup, couple of things involved there. There was, we weren't really planning on making a record, and um, there was a strange sort of fortuitous twist of events. Uh, a recording studio became available to us at just sort of strange, wonderful serendipity um, in town here. And then a tour I was supposed to be on got canceled and we were like, we should probably make some music. It just, it, everything kind of just fell into place. So, but we started writing music and then some touring opportunities came up and we decided that this would be a good year for us to maybe get back out on the road a little bit, but we also wanted to be making music. So the EP seemed like the most logical way to get things started. And then we also were taking into consideration that people don't really buy whole albums anymore. So we figure if we like split it up a little bit, maybe it would fool everybody into buying a whole album. <laughs> we'll see if that works. <laughs> Is that fair to say? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, okay. And then, Mikey, you've done some amazing work with, with orchestra. I know you did that thing in vacuum with a, a chamber orchestra. You want to tell us about that? Um, actually, that kind of evolved out of we were talking about my injury. I'd, I injured my wrist um, back in like 2006, 2007. Um, and uh, I had surgery, and I was kind of out of commission for a little while. And while I was laid up, while I wasn't really able to play guitar for a little while, I really wanted to learn how to write music that, number one, I couldn't play, you know, because I've, I've, I've always written music that was within my ability level because I was always the one playing it, you know, and playing with, with the band, you know. But there was something interesting to me about being able to write music that I couldn't play, or was on other instruments, or a group of other instruments. Um, and uh, so that was sort of uh, just my curiosity about uh, you know, learning about orchestral music, learning about writing pieces of music for other groups of musicians. Um, and uh, it was a huge, huge responsibility and a, a really difficult challenge. It was, it was just such a big undertaking. I had no idea what I was getting myself into when I first started doing it. Cause, um, you know, and then when like, you know, 80 people show up to play a piece of music that you wrote and you can tell that like three, to three quarters of them like don't want to be playing that music because, you know, the classical music world is, is very snobby. <laughs> they, you know, they, they, you know, they love Bach and Mozart and they're not very open-minded. I'm being stereotypical. I mean, obviously there are people that are much cooler than that, but there's, you know, some stereotypes are there for <laughs> a reason. And uh, it was really challenging, you know, to, to get it all to fit together and to, to make it all work. But I learned more from doing that one thing, that one concert, um, than many other years of stuff crammed into a short, you know, period of time. Uh, that was... It's just like diving into a, you know, diving into the deep end and learning how to swim. Um, but it was really fun. And uh, my my good friend um, Brian Cox, who's a physicist um, from England, he came out and did this lecture before the beginning of uh, of the concert that was just really mind blowing, and it kind of got everybody in the mood <laughs> in a really good way. And um, I don't know, it was, it was a really, really wonderful experience for me. And I, that was kind of a bit of the impetus for me wanting to go and study um, 
Yeah, it was it was it was a totally new experience for me, and I think that in making music, that's what I'm always looking for. I'm always looking for a new experience, um, and I feel fortunate in being able to have found it many times. Thank you. And then you did another um, orchestra piece called "Forced Curvature of Reflective Services" at the Disney Concert Hall. Yeah. What was that like? That was one of the most stressful experiences I've ever had in my life. <laughs> um, the Just name sounds stressful. The name. Yeah, it, w it was. Name. Well, I didn't really have any opportunity to um, hear what the piece was going to sound like before it was performed. It was just kind of like, here, you know. That was such an interesting thing for me to be able to write this piece of music that I couldn't really, I had to imagine it in my mind before having ever heard it. So it was like writing all of this information down. It was actually, that piece of music was actually a project that I was working on while I was at Harvard. So it was actually something I did for school. So I was given the opportunity to, to have this piece performed at the Disney Hall, which I was absolutely not going to say no to, but I had to figure out a way to make it so that I would have time to actually write the music. So I went to one of my professors at Harvard and said, hey, I've, I've got to write this piece of music to be for the Disney Hall, and um, you know, could I you know, do this in, in your class? And the teacher was really excited about it. And so we, um, you know, I, I did it in the context of sort of a school project. And um, that was really fun. And, uh, but again, like I said, really stressful, really stressful. Because um, I was taking finals when that concert happened. <laughs> so it was like I had to fly back. I, was fl I flew back and forth a couple times. And I was in the middle of taking all these exams and... I think I remember having breakfast with you at one, like uh, right around that time, and you were like, how's it going, man? I was like, I am so stressed out. I don't think I've ever been this stressed out in my life. But it was awesome. And buy you breakfast? I think I bought you breakfast, actually. Nice. But it's fine. We have a, we have a thing going back and forth, you know? Yeah, so who pays? Whatever. <laughs> you can be my sugar daddy some days. I'll be your sugar daddy other days. It's fine. It all evens out in the end. It's a push and a pull. Mm. Yes. Mm. And you had like 12, 12 guitars and 12 strings on yes. it? Yes. So that piece of music was written. It was really a fun experiment. Um, I, wrote, I wrote it so that the, the score, the top half of the score was sort of like the mirror image of the bottom half of the score. So it was like you could fold it in half and when you open it up, it, 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 uh, it was just a reflection of itself. And so the upper half was all strings and the uh, bottom half was all guitar, but it was all um, a very specific guitar that was made by Moog, it was a synthesizer guitars, and they were all played um, with a slide as well. So they could be, um, so they could have the free freedom of motion, freedom of movement, um, the same as the stringed instruments, the, the violin and the cello. There were, only, there were no violas, it was just violin and cello. Um, and two bass players. But when they move around on their instrument, there are no frets. So they have this sort of freedom of continuous sliding ability. And I wanted the guitars to be able to do that too. So um, yeah, that was really, some of it worked great. Some of it sounded awesome. Like it was very dissonant sounding and chaotic, but some of it really didn't work at all. So I had, I had no way of being able to prepare for that. You know, it was just sort of like, a, it's like when we play festivals, um, we call it throw and go, because they throw our stuff on stage and we just go and play, and that's it. There's no checking the sound, there's no anything, you just have to do it. And that was sort of the same thing, except every person I knew, all my friends and family and everybody, Brandon and all, the, everybody's there, so I was so nervous. Oh my God, was I nervous. And, because um, when you're in a band, you know, like, we go out on stage together, it's like we can all, you know, we can suck together it's fine we can fall into each other not yeah. quite quite as painful did but you catch me mad dogging you at the disney show i was in the audience going <laughs> 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 did, did brandon throw anything <laughs> no <laughs> i didn't see it i couldn't see i can't see like now it's like now you know like i can see like the first row of people but it, but it's like the lights are in our eyes so yeah, yeah i couldn't see brandon mad dogging me so i'm glad it would have been scary for me <laughs> i was already terrified <laughs> Yeah, man, so, Brandon, there was one year where Incubus did 250 shows in one year. How, how do you get enough energy to, to, to do that many shows? Caffeine had a lot to do with it. Um, that was, it was, I remember, I remember that year. I feel like there was a few years where we did that in a row. Maybe they weren't 
250 shows each year, but it certainly felt like it. We um, were younger. Yeah, we were it's easier. We we're a lot younger. At one point, we were for a few years we were traveling around, um, just driving ourselves in a van with a trailer. And as challenging as that was, there was also uh, an economy to it of sorts because we were so self-contained, and so we didn't have this sort of lumbering small city that we were traveling with, is sort of how it is now. You know, you, you physically can't do as many shows um, the way that we do them now. And we're actually pretty economical as far as um, touring bands are concerned. But, um, you know, we would, we would piggyback on tours. We would do our own shows in bars and people's backyards and stuff. Um, there was one stretch, I remember we did 12 shows in a row and we were doing like doubles during the day. And it's actually really hard because as I think probably especially for a singer because their instrument is a little bit more unpredictable and sometimes yeah delicate. when you don't when you don't sleep you get grumpy yeah and when you don't eat too but when you're only all. eating waffle house and you're not sleeping very well you can say the same for me though so it's fine grumpsters we did all right though i think that that's probably in going back to the original part of the conversation that that's probably where our our friendship and the core of our relationship really, um, for want of a better term, came in handy, you know? So those of us in the band, which was all of us at that point who had known each other our entire lives, it was like we would get snappy at each other and be like, I'm sorry, I was a dick. <laughs> I didn't mean that. This catfish at Cracker Barrel is really getting to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's true though. I mean, those are the sort of those are the things that we were dealing with. It sounds ridiculous now that I'm saying it out loud. <laughs> yeah, and Mikey, apart from all that great work, you've also started doing film scores with one of the world's greatest, Hans Zimmer. Tell us about working on Sherlock Holmes and, and Spider Man 2. I didn't do any work on Sherlock Holmes, but I did work on Spider Man 2. And uh, also a bunch of other films um, with Hans. He's amazing. Um, he's a really great guy. He's actually. Um, kind of one of the reasons why we're able to make music now. You know, he provided us with the studio, you know, and uh, we just figured, wow, we've got access to this great studio. We might as well make music. And we, we, like Brandon said before, we didn't really have any plans for that. So he sort of inadvertently kind of got us together to start making music. You know, I was talking to him this one day and I, he said, what are you up to? What's the band up to? And I said, well, we're kind of starting to fit, you know, think about making music. We don't really, don't, don't really know where we're gonna do it though, you know. And he was like, "Well, why don't you just take the studio?" <laughs> we're like, "Okay." This Sounds is good. also uh, we were out of our record deal at this point, right? Yes. We didn't have like we didn't have a manager. We had no record deal. We had no plan of any kind. And actually, it was kind of a liberating moment. It was an awesome time period. Yeah, actually, and, and continues to be. <laughs> yeah, and for for anyone that might not be aware, which. Um, probably have to have been living under a rock. Hans Zimmer is a very famous uh, film music composer and uh, he's a really great dude, but he's also like scored the music to probably every movie you've seen in the past 15 years. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he, he's amazing and it's great just being in his proximity. Um, many years ago, I met him, I don't know, it was probably like 12 years ago, and he told me a long time ago, hey, if you ever want to get into doing movies or you just want to make music in a different way than you've done it in the past, call me up. Like, you know, let's He's talk. He's trying to steal you out of the band, man. And he, <laughs> he, uh, and a few years ago, like, I don't know, three, two and a half years ago, I called him up. I was like, hey, man, remember you told me to call you? And he was like, all right, I've got a place for you. So he gave me a little studio and he has a complex of studios. And uh, he gave me a little room in there. And my fiance is a, a violinist who does a lot of, she did a lot of, she did Sherlock Holmes uh, with him and uh, a lot of other films, Interstellar, um, 12 Years a Slave. Um, and I was able to actually do little bits of work on those movies as well, on 12 Years a Slave and on uh, Interstellar, just like little pieces here and there, um, which was amazingly fun and cool. And um, yeah, all of a sudden, you know, just being in his world, you know, it's it's proximal. It's like if you're around when something's happening, they'll go, Mike, come in here. What do you think of this? You know, and all of a sudden you're, you know, writing music for this movie or whatever. That has yet know. to work for me, <laughs> being at the studio. But I do uh, sort of loiter around some of the studios. 
Mm. Uh, it'll it'll happen. Don't worry. La, 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 la. Hans is actually shy in a certain way. He, he probably just assumes he, you're not interested. That's what he said to me actually hmm. a long time and ago. And you told him otherwise, right? No, he was asked. He 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 assumed that I didn't want to be involved. Oh, oh like early yeah. on, like er, er, early on, me. he was like, "Well, I don't want to bother you," you know. So he probably thinks the same about you. Um, he he he'll he'll knock on the door and you know and come in and say hi. He'll be like, "What are you guys doing in here?" He's done that a few times, you know. Yeah, man, I actually met Hans twenty years ago when he did the music for Cool Runnings, the Jamaica Bobsled yeah. movie. So yeah, really, really great guy. Awesome. Yeah, man, he's such and, um, a great so, guy. So, uh, so one last question, Brandon, what advice you have for up and coming um, musicians and people out here in the business to make sure that they don't get um, shafted like you all did with Sony? <laughs> It's a very good question. You know, I. The thing that comes to mind would be um, for people to to focus on what excites them. You know, especially with creative endeavors. I feel like if you're pursuing things that are are tickling your heart and your head at the same time, you know, that are making you feel that sort of that that magical wonderment that's hard to describe. You're probably heading in the right direction. So that's what we've been chasing this whole time. I feel like you know you. Those um, those moments of excitement and um, I really feel like what I've been doing at least is is trying to um, create environments around me and nurture environments around me that are sort of welcoming to that sense of uh, magic and that sense of creativity and uh, it seems to show up a little more often when I sort of provide an environment that it sort of wants to come to. Does that make sense? Yeah, man. Yeah. Definitely. So, um, streaming, we have some questions coming in from the streaming. Um. Okay, we got this? Yeah. Okay. So, we have uh, questions from some of our online viewers. Just to open it up, and then you guys think about uh, what you'd like to ask. So this, uh, the online question comes from Kim Morgan, and the question is for Mike. She wants to know, uh, what is your favorite song to perform live? Mm, favorite song to perform live. Uh, that changes all the time. Um, I'll have a different answer for that, you know, every week, really. Um, God, what have, what have we been doing that's really fun? It's all fun, <laughs> you know, we, we, uh, you know, we play these songs and, and some of them we change. For example, I, I'll just say this. I, I really enjoy playing the song Dig. We have a song called Dig. Um, and uh, we've changed that song many times over the course of the last 10 years. Um, and it's continually fun. And I've actually always enjoyed playing that song live much more than the recording of it. The recording of that song has always been sort of like, kind of like, uh, whatever to me <laughs> for some reason, but playing it live is uh, much more impactful. And we've been able to, um, playing it live has actually really shaped the way I feel about that song, much more so than probably many of the other songs that we've uh, written and recorded over the years. So that's my current answer. That's, it brings up an interesting point though, because um, I don't know if you remember, what, while we were recording that song, we, we were certain with what we knew, the lyrics and the melody and like the structure was gonna be. But then the rest of the song really like hovered in limbo for a long time. And it was as if it didn't want to have a body. It wanted to just sort of float around and be whatever it wanted to be. But we yes. had to give it a body in that moment in time. So yeah. now live, we can sort of like change its clothes all the time. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Thanks, Kim. Good question. OK. We'll take questions from the audience. Um, and we'll pass around the mic. So raise your hand. Saw back here first. Who raised your hand first? Here, right here, right here. Here we go. Hi guys. Um, I'm from Seattle, so just wanted to say uh, thanks for being here. What's your name? Kyle. Hey Kyle. Um, and your music was kind of like the reason I started playing guitar. So nice. thank you for that. And very welcome. Um, my question kind of doesn't have to do with music, but since you guys are from Southern California, what what are your favorite places around here, and where do you go that kind of um, excites you and gets your inspiration going to get back in the studio or maybe think of some new music? I'm continually uh, fascinated and enthralled by California. Like, all of it, though. It's such a, I mean, it's like a small country. 
in and of itself. Um, I get really excited to go to the studio, so I go to the studio. <laughs> it's fun to show up there. It's also near your house. It's near yeah. where you live, so it's like, yeah. it's like, oh, you want to record there? That's a good idea. Yeah, and it wasn't my idea to record at that studio, which is the best thing. <laughs> I was like, yes, we'll record there. Um, I, I really love Southern California, but I also really, um, uh, I have a, a thing for Central and Northern California coast. Um, so anytime I feel like I need like a recharge in my environment, I usually head north. If you haven't seen it, I would recommend it highly. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. I'll, I'll second that motion, actually. I, you know, we, both of us were born and raised right here in, in Southern, in Los Angeles. And um, more recently, just as far as places that I've been going to spend time is in uh, Northern California, um, up in the Plumas County area, which is, is uh, in the Sierra Nevada mountains. It's really beautiful up there. And um, I, I absolutely love it. So yeah, it's just far as a place that I like to go, someplace that gets me um, inspired, makes me feel um, it just really kind of resets me in a in a good way. When in doubt, go to the woods. Yes, the forest, mm. the magical, mystical forest. Unicorns and dragons and things like that. They have dragons in Plumas. Yeah, but they're da it's dangerous because fires can really break out easily. So oh, they, so they're like they make their keep their mouths shut. They keep put calm. muzzles on them. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Kyle. Just hey. Hello. Hi. My name is Charlie, and thanks for being here. What's up, Charlie? And so before, Brandon, you guys described your relationship as kind of a push and pull, where you know you kind of take turns, like paying for each other. So, <laughs> at it, you know, you know. Yeah. I mean that. Uh, I mean that's just an example of how, like, at one time someone would kind of be hustling and doing more work for the two of you, and then you have a time where it's, you gotta relax and kinda take a break, and someone else like kinda picks you up. And, um, cause I know there's just many kinda ways to be as you go through whatever journey or happening you're into. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking of one where you're just like completely independent and you, you know, you're always kinda on your own just opposed to when you have like a companion. Does this, that kind of work? I'm sorry, I don't understand the, um, the, the question. I think he means that is, is it easier working together rather than working by yourself? I mean, but just um, not only in music, but just like going through life when you always, you have a companion yeah. that you take turns like a lot of work and relax, sure, and like sure, a lot sure. of work, rather than just a constant even flow of maintaining independent balance. I think I understand. Uh, you know, there's, there's always gonna be moments when sort of going it on your own is um, something to do and there'll be benefits to that. You know, you're traveling lighter and you're, you're just like hoofing it, so to speak. Um, but I found that in, in a bigger sense, in a, in a more um, absolute sense, I don't think anything of real value can be accomplished uh, without a team. And when you have people that you work well with, um, you can really, you know what they say, it's like two heads are better than one. It's like you can just do more when you understand your own limitations, first and foremost, sometimes even celebrate them, but then you meet people who you gel with on a personal level who have abilities that you don't, and then hopefully they recognize in you abilities that they don't have, and you guys are like friends, and you know, it's partnership. That stuff is, that makes the world go around, you know? And that goes for bands, but it also goes for larger groups of people, like in everyday life, like a, like a town or a city, when that stuff is functioning well, it's actually amazing what can happen. Um, you know, we were, uh, had the strange misfortune of being like in New York City on September 11th in 2001. And here we were like, you know, transplants in this city. And what we knew most about it was that it's like we're the most rude people 
in the world live and interact with each other and it's all like, you know, ev everyone's alone there in the biggest city in the world. But I watched in a split second this city of millions of people just like completely band together and organize in a way that I did not think was possible. And so that's a, a, a obviously a much larger example, but it's pretty wild what could be accomplished when, when people put their heads together. I don't know if that answers your question, but. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, hello. Hello. Uh, what would you recommend to new musicians uh, that, that, that are starting? What do you recommend if they want to succeed in music scene? What do you recommend? Well, Brandon was kind of talking about that a few minutes ago, um, you know, about doing things that you love, um, finding ways, you know, if you're inspired by something, you're, I think you're going to work a lot harder at it. And what I would add to what Brandon was saying earlier is, um, in certain ways, it's harder for new musicians because, you know, the music industry has, has changed a lot. But in other ways, it's easier. And young people and just musicians in general, it's not just musicians, anybody, um, we have so much more, so many more tools to use now. Like, technology has made it so that making albums is really easy. Re making recordings is so easy to do um, with minimal equipment. Um, if you have a great idea for something, you can share it with literally the whole world within seconds. You know, once it's ready to go, you can post it up on places where somebody will see it, you know? It's harder to get it noticed because, you know, there's so much out there now, but at the same time, it's instantaneous. I, I truly believe that. If you have a great idea, if you've written something special, somebody's gonna hear it, and it's never been easier to get it out there into the world and to share it with people all over the world. Um, so, in certain ways it's difficult, but in other ways it's, it's easier. Like, we didn't have any of those tools. You know, YouTube and SoundCloud and Beatport, all these different ways that people are sharing music with each other. Um, we had cassette. Yeah, we didn't even have email or, you know, noth none of that stuff. It, it's just, um, so take advantage of that. Take advantage of the things that you have available to you. They feel so normal because they're ever present in everybody's life, and now kids grow up and they've always had computers, they've always had internet, they've always had email, um, but they're really powerful things, really powerful, not just for, for sharing music, but for making the music. And what Brandon was saying earlier, um, you know, do the things that are inspiring and fun to you and it'll, it won't feel like work. It'll just be you doing what, you know, the things that we do, we, we would do them for free. We were lucky that we, we did. We, we did it for free for many years. I remember the first time we ever, you know, finished a tour and, and came home and found out that we actually got paid money to do what we had just done. I was shocked. Yeah. I was just like, wow, really? <laughs> I can't believe, I, I thought I was like, I still think that it's like we're getting away with something, you know? <laughs> like somebody's gonna figure it out, figure us out, you know? Um, but yeah, um, you know, utilize all of these amazing opportunities that we have now, even just the technology. You know, something else, it makes me think of something that is kind of neat, that when you are pursuing the things that are really exciting you and inspiring you, and it doesn't feel like work, like you were saying, um, there's this really, really high possibility that you'll wake up one day and be actually an expert at that thing. You just wake up one day, 10 years later, and you just shred on the guitar. You're a crazy drummer, or you are you can write code on a computer. You know, it's like, it's that's kind of amazing. And, and that, to me, is reason enough to pursue the things that excite you and inspire you, whatever they may be. Awesome. I don't want to choose. <laughs> Hi. I'm Maureen. Um, to kind of jump off on that question, what do you think about streaming services like Spotify and how that's changed the game? And like you mentioned earlier, how you had to split your EP to sell records. What do you think about Spotify? I still don't actually think that we're going to sell any records because of that, but <laughs> it's just shot in the dark. <laughs> um, you know, we all use Spotify. We all use Pandora and YouTube and all of these things. Um, it definitely, I feel like they're going to get better 
as time goes on as far as how they um, compensate artists for the services. At the moment, it's still kind of in a, a state where it's like there are some that are better than others as far as compensating artists for their work, um, but it's still pretty difficult, especially for aspiring artists to make any money through streaming services. It's like fractions of a penny per spin, you know, so you'd have to amass like ungodly amounts of spins in order to actually make a living doing it. So, but I think that some of that stuff is really gonna be changing here in the next, hopefully sooner than later. I don't know when, but your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> I just embrace those things, you know, like, I'm just happy that people are excited enough about music to wanna go get it someplace, you know, whether it's a record store, or you, I, I listen to music on YouTube all the time. Like I kind of live on YouTube, I love it. It's awesome for everything. So um, I don't know, you know, different people have drastically different uh, points of view regarding things like Spotify, streaming services and whatever. Um, I don't know, I just think it's all good. That's easy for me to say because, you know, like I've, you know, we've been able to be successful and, and all that so I'm sure that there are musicians out there that, that would strongly disagree, but I just think in, in terms of the technology in general, I think that um, you know, we just have to embrace it. You know? you get, get a song played on Spotify, you know? That's it. It's that simple. <laughs> Hello. Hey guys, how you doing? What's up, man? Hi. Hey, what's up? I don't know if you can see me. I'll definitely no, I see you. Can, can a see your bit. silhouette. <laughs> Okay, um, first of all, you know, you guys are great. Thank you for being here. And uh, Brandon, I'm a big, big fan of your voice from, you know, from a vocalist to another. Thank I've, you. I've always loved your, your tone, your delivery is Thanks, man. very strong, kind of unapologetic, but yet sweet. Uh, I don't know, there's something about your voice, it's really cool. Thank <laughs> you. I agree. Right? I mean, it, cool. Um, my question um, is this. Um, you know, and I'm sort of going to go into the spiritual realm here. Sure. Um, do you feel like in order to get to where you're at right now or where you have been, you know, for the past 12, 15 years, successfully uh, doing something creative, are there any major sacrifices that you have had to make in terms of the way you live, the way you you know, your principles, or I know this is kind of like personal and deep, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, yeah. might as well make it worth it. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, it, is there something that you feel like you consistently do within your life that keeps, you know, those creative juices flowing, you know, keep the fires on the log kind of thing? Sure. Yeah. Um, that's a really good question. You know, I think that compromises, you know, we compromise every single day. You know, I, I meet people sometimes who are like, I am uncompromising, and those people are usually kind of jerks, and they're kind of lonely, and they get spat, you know, spit in their coffee and stuff like that. Um, I said no fat cream, you know. Um, there's little, little tiny compromises every day, and, but it's the, it's the, it's the uh, you pick your battles, you know what I mean? Like, I've, there are things that I've, decided were important to me when I was younger, and there are things that I decide are important to me today, and there are certain things that I, I won't compromise on, and I've been fortunate in my life that I haven't had to compromise those things that are the most important to me. Um, and I guess kind of um, circling back to what I was saying before with you, you know, it's like I've done my, my best in my personal life to create uh, environments around me, whether it's at home or when I'm traveling, that um, are conducive to that, that feeling arriving. And when it doesn't arrive, I don't take it personally because I know it can't always arrive, but um, what I like to do is just is stay in a sense of almost like, uh, well, this is gonna sound really cheesy, but I can't think of a better word, wonderment. I like to sort of continually remind myself of how much there is that I am not an expert in and how much there is to be in awe of every single day. And I find that I'm continually amazed at so many different things, from the smallest things to the biggest things. Um, and I usually feel like writing about it as a result. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I don't know if that answers your question at all, but 
little bit. Okay. Yeah. It's a big conversation, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Well, can I add something to that? Yeah, please. I mean, there are some very simple th sacrifices that we've made. Like, um, it's very difficult sometimes to maintain relationships, um, not just with like a significant other, but like family members, mm. your pets. You know, it, it, we're gone, you know, especially earlier in our career, gone for 10 months out of the year. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you miss tons of family functions, birthdays, holidays, all that kind of stuff. Um, so there are some there those are some heavy sacrifices to make, you know, that you're missing out on, you know, watching, you know, nephews and nieces grow up and um, you know, contact with your parents and just tons of things like that, you know. It's and like that's only a, it's like being an astronaut but you live on earth. Yeah. And that's only the, sort of the beginning Where's of it. Where's Mike? He's in space. <laughs> but I mean, but you, you really just have to love what you're doing though, you know? <laughs> like you do it for there's a greater there's a greater picture, you know. There's a there's a there's a, a reason why you're doing it. So, you know, some of those things might not necessarily feel like um, sacrifices at the time, but I think when you like for us, you know, getting a little bit older, you know, you can look back and see, wow, you know, I did I did make some decisions, and they had maybe I won't call them sacrifices. I'll just say that they had impact. They had consequences. But then there's there, and I completely agree with you. I think that there are things that occurred like in our family. Those are just some of the obvious ones, you know? Yeah, but that being said, what also happens as a result is there's almost like this, um, there's this process of the people that come into your life who perhaps are relationships that are a, a bit more shallow, they won't last if you're the, the earthbound astronaut, as I'm gonna start calling it now. Um, the people that like, really love you and that you're really in, in love with and in family with and in relationship with, like they stick around and they understand. And you give them that same, you afford them that same sentiment when they are in love with a person or a process or a project, you give them that same space. And it's a beautiful thing to be able to have that with uh, a loved one. And those are the relationships that last and those are the relationships that it doesn't feel like you're compromising anything because there's a, a, a real understanding. Uh, yeah. Hey, what's up, you guys? <clears throat> I'm over here on the side. Hi. And uh, I have two questions for you. One of them is, do you remember the space guy from the Certain Shade of Green video? Space guy? Space guy. Of course. So that's me. Oh, sweet. Awesome. What's up? It's been a, been a while. What? The, the one? Wait, in, uh, in San oh, Francisco. Oh, San Francisco. Yeah. In the, yes. at, uh, at, at Brick by Speaking Brick. Speaking of space. Or Bottom of the Hill. Bottom Sorry. Of the hill. Bottom of the Hill. That was the name of the club. I was the earthbound astronaut in the video for you. Thanks for that, man. Because Brandon's dad was the space guy he, down here, right? At the end yeah. of the video, that was my pop in the spacesuit. So, yeah. everyone, what, what, tell me your name again. My name is Tommy. What's so, up, Tommy? Tommy it's, it's was up. the guy in the astronaut suit that walked across the stage and was in the audience during, it was like one of the first music videos. Crowd surfing, made. right? I wish I did more of that in that video. It's, you did though, right? I was not very acrobatic. I definitely need to work on my space skills. <laughs> space walking. It was hot in that thing, right? It was heavy, it was hard to move around. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank but, you for your service. Well, thank you. <laughs> We're well, forever I'm, in your debt I'm, for I'm, that. I'm sure, yeah, you wouldn't be anywhere without me, I'm sure. <laughs> well, hey, I, man, I, every little piece counts. I've been here from the beginning. I loved you guys for a long time. No, thank you, man. And uh, thank you've you. always been very wise, and actually it was ironic, those lyrics that in, are in that song are about doing stuff on your own. Mm -hmm. And I feel like um, you guys are doing it on your own now without a label, which is really cool. We're on we, a label now. Yeah, we have a label now. <laughs> what, is, it, is it a major label or is it an indie? Island, company? Island Records. Oh, yeah. wow. It's a major label. Yeah, of course. I mean, obviously you're... I was just wondering if you had chosen to go that independent route and if, or if you could speak on that subject about, kind of a lot of people talk about like the problems in the industry, Spotify, streaming, yeah. and what, what, it, what do you think is a solution, you know, as far as like independent artist and making your own music, make yourself, you know, how do you do that? I don't actually think that there is a, uh, in an absolute sense, a solution. I don't know if, the way that the that technology is heading and the way that it is now and the direction it's going, I don't think that we're gonna be able to really operate in absolutes anymore. And as far as I'm concerned, that's actually okay. It, it creates a sort of non-linearity and a fluidity with things that is going to allow for 
uh, it, it's vastly democratized the process, like you were saying. It's like anyone now with an idea and a laptop can, or even a smartphone can upload something to the web, and you never know what's going to catch. The flip side of that is that it's going to make it that much harder every single day for any one thing to get noticed. So um, that brings to mind putting really cute cats in all of our music videos from this point forward. <laughs> I actually think that's an amazing, has any band done that? Just kittens crawling all over us while we're playing? We'd be huge. I like cats. <laughs> Baby tigers. Jaguars. Yeah. Jaguars. Sorry, we're digressing. Um, Jaguars. So, yeah. <laughs> we, de <laughs> we decided to um, sign with a major label um, for a number of reasons, um, but some of the, the larger region reasons were that so many of the people who were our original champions at Epic Records are now at Island Records. Am I wrong? No, that's totally right. Um, Which was exciting for us. It was like, these are the people that believed in us first, and they're still, they're, they're like, they're still enthusiastic about music, and they, I don't know. Yeah, I think that just sort of uh, to speak on that subject of independent artists versus artists signed to a major label, it really comes down to, you know, each individual person and who they are and what their goals are and what they want to spend their time doing. Because, you know, if, if you want to do everything yourself, you can. You can do everything yourself. You could market your music yourself. You could record it yourself. You can mix it yourself. You can master it yourself. You can do all of these things. It just depends on how much of your time you want to spend doing all these things. Um, if you really want to do that, do it. Awesome. Great. Um, if you would rather make the music and then let other people handle many of these other things that need to be done, then, you know, for me, um, I would rather spend my time um, worrying about the music than a lot of the other things. And there's a lot of trust that goes in, into that. You don't want to you know? do marketing meetings with me? Not particularly, as much as I love you. <laughs> um, it, those kinds of things, I might, I might want to do that for like another band. You know what I mean? But when it comes to your own music, for, for just for us, for me, um, to keep myself focused on some of the tasks that we have, um, I would rather spend my time, you know, and focus on, on a more, uh, I guess it's a more sort of simple approach to it. Um, but there are many other people who, you know, who see it very differently. And, you know, they want to control every tiny little detail about how the music gets released and um, who's listening to it and where it's going to come out and, you know, what the f every photograph looks like and what the clothes are and every little thing. And I just can't make myself care about those things. I just can't as hard as I try. But that doesn't mean that that's a bad thing. Um, it's a good thing because there are other people that do that really well um, and it shows, you know, in, in their work. But I think everybody has to figure out what it is that they want to do. And the good news is that there's a system or many systems sort of set up for however you'd like to do it, you know? You can, you can do it in the most simplistic way where you're not doing anything but, you know, writing songs and letting somebody else handle everything else. Or you can be totally in control of every single little detail. We've done each one of those permutations and, and quite a few in between as well. Um, and this really is no um, reference to the song you're talking about, Make Yourself, that's about something completely different. I mean, the lyrics in Church Hit do mean what you're talking about. About um, getting off your ass and... Yeah. Well, that's how we started. We couldn't get signed when we got started. We, um, what we were told was, you guys are great, great live band don't hear any songs yet, this term songs, like quote unquote songs, which meant like songs that could be played on the radio, which we were completely uninterested at that point. Um, I don't think we really grew up on terrestrial radio that would indicate the kind of music we were playing. I mean, we were listening to radio in the back seats of our parents' cars and stuff like that, but um, that seemed like a different world. What, what we were doing was we were, we were trying to, we just wanted to play shows, we just wanted to play concerts, you know? And Anything that could enable that yeah. was like, okay, do that. So we did, we, did, we did it on our own. Like we started our own little independent record company called Chillum Records. 
and uh, we found a distributor in San Diego, and we sold a thousand records on our own. Yes. That's all they printed too. <laughs> printed a thousand records, sold a thousand records. <laughs> That was uh, an album called Fungus Among Us, yeah. which is actually a collection. I'm glad you guys like it. Yeah. It was funny. It's, <laughs> it's so weird. It's, it's all the music like that we wrote when we were in high school and recorded at this little studio in Santa Monica where I used to work at the time. I was kind of like, the guy who owned the studio was like, I'd love to record you. And I was like, can I have a job? He was like, I guess. Can you sweep? I was like, all right, cool. And uh, yeah, it was a symbiotic, beneficial relationship. And... Um, that album, Fungus Among Us, has now sold, I think it's like about seven or 800,000 copies. That's no crazy. Way. Yes way. Really? Yes. That's so crazy. Nuts. I wish that we like. Thank you. Knew what we were doing more. <laughs> hey guys, how about one more question and yeah. then we'll wrap this up? Yeah. How Sorry, about we talk somebody a lot. over here? You want to go? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hi, my name is Bella. Hi, Bella. Um, what songs of yours are the most difficult for you to perform? Uh, that's pretty easy to answer, actually. Yeah. <laughs> uh, difficult to perform, easy to answer. It's <laughs> like a t shirt. I'll slogan. be here all night. <laughs> uh, we have a song called uh, Agoraphobia. And it's kind of a sort of a mellow song, really hard to play. Talent for chords. Me. For me, really hard for me to play. And There's a bunch of this stuff happening in that song for yeah. you. <laughs> and I also think uh, we have a song called A Crow Left of the Murder. I think that song is kind of what gave me carpal tunnel syndrome. Not anymore, though, huh? Like yeah, I can, that song I can now. fly through it now, but back then. I think that we have done something similar over the years um, with song writing. You were talking about it a little bit earlier about perf or writing music that you couldn't perform and then other people playing it. Like, well, there's, I noticed a pattern in my, uh, in my singing stuff and my, my, my contribution to the band, which would be like sort of the melodic stuff and the lyrics. And I was unconsciously, with each record we would, each record we would write, each album we'd put out, I was writing stuff that was more and more and more difficult for me to sing. And I started realizing it's because I was I was writing it at home, like super chilled out and relaxed and rested and fed and and uh, then we'd go on the road and we'd start you know playing these songs every single night. I was like, this is really hard. <laughs> All of these songs are hard. Like not one of these is. I think there was like one song in in the bunch for a period of years that was like, oh, whew, I could take a break here. Um, it never made me want to stop writing challenging material though, because I started noticing I was getting better as a singer as a result. So it was almost like I had this unconscious drive to get better at what I was doing. Um, I hope I've gotten a lot, I think I've gotten a little bit better over the years, but anyway, they're all hard. That's the answer for me. <laughs> and they're still hard. I had to like go and learn how to sing for real in order to keep up with us. <laughs> cool, man. So I want to say a special thanks to Mikey and Brandon. Let's hear it for them. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Wayne. Nice, man. And, and they were generous, generous enough that there's going to be a $5,000 scholarship in Incubus's name for a student here. So let's hear it for them for that again. Hello. Thank you guys so much for coming. It was a big pleasure. Thank you. Brandon, Mike, yeah, thank you. Wayne, terrific as usual. So, guys, uh, Another big hand, Incubus. <laughs> so we'll have archived um, the recording that we made so you can check back on our website. And please check back in with us because we will have more of these events in the future, you know, about once a quarter. So who knows what's gonna happen next. So again, big hand, uh-oh. Oh, you're hiding. <laughs> Thanks again, guys.